just do a quick sync. Yeah. Cool, good. Meet Max Fronenberg, my hero. That's me when I was five. You see, Max was kind of like my father growing up. He would take me out to eat all the time, made sure my brother and I lit the Hanukkah candles every year. He was there with a cake for every birthday. And just always gave me a lot of love. I never knew who he was though. You know, like his backstory. Until one day, I sat him down and asked him. To my surprise, I probably unraveled one of the greatest stories ever told. So, where did you grow up? I grew up in Warsaw. Warsaw is uh, the big city in Poland. We were six people in the family. I was the oldest one. I was born in 1921. My name is Max Fronenberg. I am a survivor from the Holocaust. Growing up, we all hear about the great love stories. Romeo and Juliet, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, this was no different. Stories of such unparalleled romance that they could only exist in fiction or be of some distant, bygone time. What I could have never guessed, though, was that a story as powerful and compelling as those could belong to my own grandfather. This story, like all great love stories, begins in the most unlikeliest of times, in one of the darkest pages of history. The Holocaust. Germany, 1934. Adolf Hitler has brought an entire country to its knees underneath his Nazi regime, a political party rooted with basic tenets of violence and racism. Hitler unleash scores of measures and legal mandates against the Jews, which stripped them of their money, jobs, and basic human rights. These laws dehumanized the Jewish race entirely. So that I could better understand the world that this story takes place in, I decided to start my research at the Los Angeles Holocaust Museum. As I walked the halls, poured through archival footage, diaries, and letters, I felt numb a state of total shock. Before the war, I was in a technical school. A year later, I was supposed to graduate. I was in school. Some kids were anti-Semitic. I remember one time I was going home, and they had to be in packs, four or five of them, you know. And then, oh, there's a Jew. And then they would try and run after me and try to beat me up. But I run fast. I was 18 years old. The war broke out in 1939. There's no more schooling. The Germans stepped into Poland, into Warsaw, and it was occupied by the German. Nazi propaganda created widespread anti-Semitism as people were attacked and beaten on the streets. Homes, businesses, and synagogues were set to fire. Under Hitler, grew the ugly sentiment that Jews were a disease of which there could only be one cure, extermination. I saw bodies on the carts. I saw some of those people were so thin that it was unimaginable that a person could live. I just could not believe that people could do something of that nature. That it was an inhuman actions. It's like 
lost in my mind. In 1942, they need some workers to work in the prison. They took me out from the middle of the night and they brought me into Paviak. Paviak is a big prison. In that prison was approximately between three and 4,000 people. And the prison was in the center of the ghetto, not far where we used to live, it's just in the next street. The ghetto was a sectioned off area of Warsaw with the specific purpose of storing the remaining Jews, only to be slowly distributed out to concentration camps. And I was working there in the beginning as a sheet metal worker. We just uh, repaired the lick on the roof. They got some things to repair for the kitchen, like pots and pans, it uh, has to be repaired. I brought it in my father to work as well. I used to go home every day from the prison. We walked in, we walked home. I got the two bread for the working day in the beginning, till the liquidation of the ghetto. Liquidation was when the Nazis would expel all Jews from the ghetto, shipping them to concentration camps on cattle trains. The first liquidation started up the 22nd of July and finished it of the 8th of September. At first, people could only speculate as to what was happening. Liquidated, uh, they call it Umsiedlung. The, the German told us are we just taking out from Warsaw on a smaller place? They thought the liquidation was merely a transferring from one ghetto to another. But actually they took him out to liquidation centers, to the gas chambers. They were instructed to remove all clothing for what was to be a group shower, then pack upwards of 2,500 people into a room fit for 500. Close the doors and bolt them shut. Gas would pour in through metal cylinders in the ceiling, filling the chamber with poisonous fumes and killing all who were inside. You can still see the scratch marks on the walls as they clawed for one last breath. They took away the, my mother and the brothers and the sister, and my uncles, my the grandmas, and they took away them. And up till today, I never saw them. The Nazis would sometimes take entire families out of their homes and onto the road for a more public display of terror. Each member of the family would be ordered to their knees and executed. One by one, with a bullet straight to the back of their heads. There was no mercy or question at all. Amongst the Nazis was a strong sense of satisfaction when killing a Jew. For them, it was a feeling of great pride as they believed it was for the betterment of their future nation. No one was spared. You see, this was an execution of a vermin species that needed to be annihilated at any cost. The first phase in their master plan to cleanse the earth of the Jewish people so that they no longer could infect the rest of the general population. In that time, it was approximately by 370,000 people living in the ghetto. In September, approximately the 8th of September, it was left over only by 60,000. 
we became prisoners. They, they hold us back, all the workers, they hold us back in the prison. They brought us in, in the prison cell. In my group, it was left over seven people. I, my father, three shoemakers, and two tailors. I got my working place in the women's part of prison. The girls, the girls was taking out, there was a yard. On, the, on one side of the yard was my shop. They used to take them out for a walk all around the yard. I saw the, a girl walking. And I said to myself, she's Jewish. I was the youngest in that prison. I got closer, you know. Through the window, a man was saying, there is many like us. I was afraid to lift my eyes up. Then I hear again, there is many like us. Finally, I look at him. And I thought he was a gypsy. Black mustache, bushy black eyebrows. Later on, I walked up and I told her, I said, are you from us? She said, no. Oh, oh. I said, okay. I am, was born in Poland. And we grew up uh, with uh, non-Jewish girls, like sisters. Then the Germans came in the Jews were evacuated to the ghetto. They didn't know I was Jewish. When the war broke out, many Jewish people were able to conceal their identities to prevent from being murdered. I didn't know where to go. I didn't have a, a penny in my pocket. So the leader of the underground movement, this was Polish people who worked for the underground. He recognized me, but he didn't say anything. And they start asking me questions. Who are you? So I started crying and I told him who I am. He made my new identification papers with my picture. And maybe a year, less than a year, the Gestapo came in, everybody was arrested. And a German, he was taking the passport, the identification paper, and marking down who are you and where you come from. in that prison. They didn't know I was Jewish. Rina was taken to Pavyak as a political prisoner. I uh, came up once, I came up twice, three times. And one day he came upstairs and I was cleaning the corridor. And again he said, there is money like us. And then I wrote him a note. The guard at the gate was, maybe she went to the bathroom, she wasn't there. So I gave him a note that I am Jewish. My name is Rosenbaum. I don't have a chance to survive. I don't know if I'm going to live through. If you live through and I'm going to live through, maybe we're going to meet together. Or if I'm not going to live through. If you have a chance to survive, notify my family. I uh, rem remember the town from where she comes out, what the name is, what the father did. Nothing in writing. I kept it in uh, memory. After the 22nd of May, 1943, they catch some Jewish people hiding in the Christian site at Warsaw. Then they, they brought it in because they did need the workers. Initially, while researching Max's story, I thought that Max and Rena were the only survivors of Paviak alive and able to fill in the details. However, the more I researched, the more I discovered while on a trip to Israel, I tracked down a man by the name of Joseph 
at Le Savage. Joseph was also a survivor of Paviac and was there with Max and Rena in the prison. After hearing Joseph's incredible story, I found a camera crew in Israel so we could sit down with Joseph and do a formal interview. My name is Joseph Atlasovich. As we have been about uh, 35, 40 prisoners, Jews, all Jews, they catched in ghetto also. After doing some more research into the other names that Max mentioned from Paviak, I discovered the final missing piece to this puzzle. A man by the name of Barry Newman, still alive and living in Miami. I booked the first plane out to meet him. Is it then? It's on, it's rolling, okay. that's it. Um, okay, so maybe we'll start with... Um, what? When was the first time that you met Max? The first time I met Max was when we were in Paviak. Every day, what we saw, they put a couple guys against the wall and it boo, 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 boo. We call it a schmeisser, you know. You got 32 bullets. They put it up the people again against you. We used to hear crook, crook. That's all. They machine gun them. They drop them off on the truck if it away. Every day, every day, they were executing. Max had thought about escaping many times, yet believed that even if he was successful, that there was absolutely nowhere to go. I was a driver in the prison with a, a small pickup truck. I used to go every day out every morning, 6 o'clock, 6.30, and leave the prison with the truck with a German beside. He got a gun, a pistol. And every day uh, I used to go out and go into this, with him to the store. They have special store supply for them. We were not talking. We only was talking uh, to pick up, you pick up that or we pick up that it would be impossible to run away with the truck. They would kill my father. I always was thinking of my father. If, he, if I escaped, he escaped with me. My father was the last person in my family that was left. If I would escape, if they would catch me, they would hang me or they would put you a bullet in the head. So he did what he was told and drove the truck back and forth every day. Unknowingly, this helped Max build a relationship with one of the guards that would end up being a vital part to his future plans for escape. If they find out who I am, they will kill me. Normally in Pavia do the war, especially Polish prisoners. They don't keep them for months, they don't keep them for years, they don't they keep them a week, two, three, four. Max knew somebody in the front office who was doing the paperwork for the for the Gestapo. I've been there a year and I never been called for interrogation. If I would be called in for the interrogation, I would be sitting here. I found out that every time my papers were up, the, uh, somebody that Max knew in the head office put my papers underneath. I've been dead. I wouldn't stand a chance so far. Uh, uh, to, to, to survive. In the sewing shop, there were Jews and the Poles. So he told me to try to get into the shop. 
In the tailor shop, Rena would be less likely discovered as a Jew, and Max would be able to check up on her more often while doing small odd jobs for the guards. So I told the commandant of the women's prison, you know, I used to be a dressmaker. I got in there and he was like a runner. Uh, this guy needs a pair of pants or this one needs that. So he was the one who was allowed to come and go. Some uh, girls got killed. They, they dressed them first, you know, and they took him out uh, and they killed him. And I took the, that clothes and I gave it to the girls. It came the fall. I was the youngest of the prison and I had no shoes. I was practically bare feet. She was working in the sewing shop. I got the, the possibility to go up and to see her. And she brought me something warmer to put it on. So I didn't want to make it uh, too much visible, uh, the, like she's Jewish or she's not Jewish. I told her, the winter is coming. I'm going to make a pair of boots and a pair of the shoes. Max tried to help whoever he could while in the prison, but felt a special connection to Rena. I told her to put the, the, the foot down on a piece of paper and mark my foot on it. Even though they only had a few moments together each day, their connection began to go stronger for one another. He just was a wonderful human being. He made me a pair of boots and later he made me a pair of shoes. Some of people escaped and, and they survived, but also a lot of people got cut. They tried to escape midnight. People are coming and working there, about 10 of them. Instead to come back to the prison, they stay inside. They decide that they have to escape to the window of the second floor for this building. They escape putting in the, the sheets together. They escape through the window. They go on, on the wall. They jump down from the prison. And they start to run away. And they ask for, for other Germans to come. They bring them back to the prison. All of them, they were catched, and they all were there. All of them, they were hanged in prison. They killed all by hanging them. Max finally realized that regardless of anything, eventually, he might see the same fate someday, and it was time to find a way out. Later on, we got some contact with the underground. We come to a decision that sooner or later they will kill us as they're killing other Jews and we must escape from the prison and we decided to dig a tunnel then I went out and measured from the build from the edge of the building till the middle of the street where the sewer is how many meters one plumber blocked the toilet 
He say he has to go into the sewer to unblock it. And he measures up the height, how deep the sewer is. The sewer was approximately by the, between three and three and a half meter deep, about six, seven meter to the middle of the street. I took those measurements, the Blumber brought his measurement. We got one of the engineer and he gave us the square root. Not to dig down straight, just right away from the point where we are. We got two meters down. One, one meter is the foundation of the building and one meter straight down is a basement. One side of the basement on the right hand side, there was actually little shops. In the left hand side of that basement, was plain a basement, was not finished. Capitalizing on the relationship with the guard whom he had driven with every morning, Max convinced him that there was mold in the basement where they were working and that it needed to be sealed off to prevent them from getting sick. And we closed that door completely. There was no entry from the basement to the place of digging. After closing, nobody could catch up. On the carpet now, champ, we took off a planer. I know where the shovels in a special place. I took two shovels. When we start digging, we were afraid. Maybe they're going to see us. When the German was not inside in the workshop, so the way they went out of arrangement, something or eating or something like that. So we used this time an hour, half an hour, two hours, but more, and then we come back. So what we decide, very clever, in special pens what we got, and we put it, load it up with sand, and we took it and we spilled it out. That's it. Later the next day, we went again, and we did do the same thing. So that was a long process. The warden didn't know nothing. I knew they were digging a tunnel. She touched me and, and was some sand on, the, uh, on my clothing or something, I don't know. And I said, how come you have the sand? So he told me about it. I said, you know what? We start digging a tunnel, we, uh, we, I'm gonna escape. After a few months digging, we came out right on top of the sewer. I went back, I brought a, a hammer and a chisel, and we opened up the sewer, and I told, we told the guys, let's go. There were about 17 people. Now one group went to the left, one group went to the right. So not everybody should go with the same sewer. We decided that everybody has to go for himself. I and told my father, you stay on the right hand side. It's very, very dark. I lost my father in the sewer. You know, but on the street, you, you know, you got those manholes from the sewer and they got some, like a ladder, but it's made from a thick wire. And I got up and I tried to push out that cover from the manhole to get out. When I push it one time, I couldn't touch it. After the resting maybe an hour or two, I don't know how long, I say, I'm gonna go up again. I went up again. If God helped me, if God didn't help me. One thing, one thing what I know, the power in that, thing, in that moment gets so strong, you can lift it a house because you, you fighting right now, you fighting for your life. In honest to God, I only put a bit, like be touching only. The cover fall down on the other side. The 
the first thing you have to know, the escaping is number one. Number two, when you come and come from the tunnel, where I'm going, I have no home, I have no clothes, I have no money. What am I doing? That is the question. The surviving is not what you escape. The escape is on the part one. We walked out at 6 o'clock in the morning. We walked out. The shoe it was full of dirt and so on. And we went into one place. And I, we got, I got myself uh, working clothes, you know, the one piece. And Carol, she got one piece. And the other guy, Goodman, he said, I'm staying here. I'm afraid to, to, to walk. I said, listen, I don't know if we've been able to come back for you. No, no, you're going to come back. They had no idea where to go or how to hide. Walking for miles from town to town, searching for somewhere they could stay for a few nights and be safe. Max had a contact with someone from the Jewish underground. As we walked there, there was 12 Jews, 11 Jews. And they're living in that basement for two years. I was the 397th Jews what registered, what uh, lived through the Holocaust. Just one year later, this nightmare eventually ended in 1945, when the Americans and Russians defeated the Nazi troops liberating the Jews from these prisons and camps. By this time, six million Jews had been killed, and the history of the human race had been changed forever. Max had assumed that Rena died in Pavyak, and although he felt the pain and sorrow of losing her, he had at this point become all too familiar with death and accepted it as the norm for people who he loved in his life. My father, he got out with six people, I think. Luckily, he was able to reconnect with his father after joining the same Jewish rights group once returning back to Warsaw. After the war, I didn't know if anybody survived from my family. I lost track of everybody, like everybody else. You know, it was three, over three years and I, I didn't think that any Jews remained alive. I know she went in transport. That's all that I know. If, she, if she's alive, if not alive, you know that this question of being alive is only a question of minutes and seconds. You know, what you are alive in a second later, you're gone. We were sitting and waiting for connection. A man walked over and he started talking. He asked me, when did you survive? So I said that I was in Pavyak. So he said, I was in Pavyak. You must know my friend Max because he used to come to the women's prison. I was like, I, I didn't know how to I became like a numb, completely frozen. He said that he always was talking about the girl, and I figured the only girl that he was interested in is me. He told me he's going to see Max. He walked away because his train was coming. I didn't want to tell him who I am. You know, you have the mentality from the war that you keep it secrets. And then I said to myself, idiot, the war is over. There's no fear. And I told them, tell, if you meet Max, tell him that his friend from Pavyak is alive. He was shocked, but he had to run to the train. And I was walking, the train didn't stop at our town because it was, I guess, bombed or whatever. So I walked 18 kilometers and walking uh, near a Jewish cemetery, I met a woman with a man.
and she started uh, calling my Rina? name, and I, she, she and I ran Rina? to each other. She was like maybe a little younger than my mother, and she told me, she said the whole family's alive. I, I, I thought I'm going to get a heart attack just hearing that. I didn't know where they are or what they are, so she told me where to go. And I ran, and I went to our house where we used to live. And I came home and I saw my father. It's very, very difficult to explain the feelings when I met my dad, I thought that he's going to get a heart attack or I'm going to get a heart attack. We were hysterical. And don't forget, I'm mean, the youngest. And my father was like touching my face and, and touching my arms. It's, a, it, it's if I am for real. And the same thing was for me. If my father wouldn't be who he was before the war, he had a lot of Polish friends and they supply us with food and a place where to live. This was like a dream of a thousand million nights. A few days later, when he told me that she's alive, I went down to see her. And it took maybe two days, three days, but in the middle of the night somebody knocks on the door. And he came in, I almost passed out. I mean, it was like a miracle. And he walked in. I was in shock, really in shock. I said, this is, so they wanted to know who is he. So I told him that this is the guy who really tried to sort of do the best he could to help me. And I didn't, I just, that's what I was able to, to even be able to talk about it because I thought I'm going to choke from, from excitement. It was like a miracle that anybody is alive. Ooh, I get the goose pimples. First thing, I like her. And it was a little bit of, uh, not a little bit, I, in that time I don't know how much uh, love is in there. But I know I helped the girl. You know, we were talking and talking and talking. I knew that he was a very special person, even in prison. And I stay overnight. And then he couldn't stay. I, he had to meet somebody. I forgot whom. And the next morning, next morning, I left. You know, the, the, the first thing, yeah, you're thinking how to survive. The surviving, that means uh, to get involved in some kind of business. Uh, I got involved in smuggling. He was a regular general, a real general, a Jewish man, Mishka. He took us, a couple guys, gave us, not uniform, he gave us top, look like the army, and he had a trot. And what he was doing is going to the factories and he said to them, I need matches. So me and Max and another guy, we went with him to load it up. We load up a full truck of matches. In the truck, I was standing, the truck got a step. And I was standing with a pepesha, with a gun. The Russian pepesha is with a 72 bullets. And I was wearing a big coat to have it hide it. And if somebody wants to stop up, like we would shoot, you know? The coat was a long coat till the angle. And the coat was, if I, when the truck was driving it, it was taking the coat under the, the wheel and he pulled me down underneath the truck. Fell off the truck, he almost died. Very injured, he was run over by the truck. He broke the ribs, he broke a lot of stuff. He didn't look good, we were crying. There was no communication. I didn't hear anything from him in a very long time. We took him to the hospital, a general, where it was, he had a connection. He brought me in the hospital, a military hospital. As a soldier, 
I was not a soldier, but they brought me as a soldier. Only uh, Russian military uh, people, the major give a name, uh, Zaitsov or something like that, I don't know. And they, maybe they're still looking for that guy Zaitsov. I was injured as a military man. A military man doesn't pay any bill. The pelvic broken in two here and in the back, injured in the spine. And I was there six weeks. He figured it was only a matter of time before they found out he was under a fake name. And I walked out from the hospital without the knowing and up till today. I went to town. Times were very uncertain. And maybe he got hurt, maybe he married somebody else, maybe he's away, maybe... I didn't think that way, I just thought he's lost. When he came to the door, when I look at him, I told them the ground is singing under my feet. I was in shock. And I told him, I thought that simply be, went, he went his way and I went my way. And uh, he just looked at me and I felt his look was killing me. Like, I felt that my heart would fall out. I felt so guilty and hated myself, just hated myself. One thing you must understand, we lived not normal time. From one minute to the other, you didn't know where you're going to be and what you're going to do and, and with whom you, you didn't think really realistic about the future. We had no future. I had a very good husband. He understood and he didn't say a word. I was like choking because I look at his face, his eyes, the pain. I, I felt sick. I didn't know about the accident or anything. I look at his eyes and I felt that the ground is slipping under my feet. I thought that I'm going to drop that. I thought I'm going to pass out. I felt speechless. When he walked away, I felt that whatever I do, if I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be unhappy because God will punish me for the way I acted. Love is just a word, but this was really different. Deep, deep feeling for each other. After Max's disappearance, Rena's father married her off to another man. She's married already. And what is the use me to hang around? I went back to back home to Warsaw. When we saw him, we didn't believe that he's alive. We had no way to go to visit him or anything. We had no transportation or anything. Walking on the street in Warsaw, I saw a lady walk on the street. I said to myself, oh, that, must have, that must be Helena. 
And I went in the back and I say, oh, I'm sorry, maybe I make a mistake. You should tell her, oh, Max. Oh. She was in prison before. She got freed as a Christian. And we were talking. I said, uh, what are you doing with yourself? You know, I didn't see you for two or three weeks. Then she said, well, I'm doing nothing, you know. Then I said to her, you know what? You alone, I'm alone. Why don't we get married? Just like that. Then she said, maybe it's a good idea, I will let you know. An hour later, by talking, he said, okay, let's go together. We got married the end of the, uh, the 31st of December. I got the one, the one son, Louis. He was born in Poland in 1947. We moved from there to Israel. Iris was born in Israel. From Israel, we moved to Vienna. We lived there from 1952 to 1955, December. And from Vienna, we moved to Canada. Then we came to Montreal. Max and Alina had an entire life together. They bought a home, raised their kids together in Montreal, Canada. Their son, Louis, went on to become a doctor and their daughter, Iris, a designer. He started his own successful metal manufacturing company. They were very much in love with each other and led a beautiful life together. I moved to Toronto with my husband and my two children. When my husband passed away, I was barely 50 years old. We reconnected, you know, because people talk about the past. Our survivors population is like telephone without wires. He came to my children's weddings. I knew Max's wife. I met her many times, we were friends. I knew that Halina was very sick. I was really, really in shock to find out that she passed away. I used to, used to come to that cemetery 50 years ago. Is that everything what you see was empty? Max still goes to Helena's grave every year since she passed to visit and pay his respects. He says sometimes he could feel her presence. How did you meet the really Max? After Pat passed away, we got we get together. She's alone. I did, uh, many times I went to Toronto, but I didn't try to see her. Uh, Max used to come on business. He called to say that he's in the city because we were friends. So we met. One time she came to us a meeting. And little by little, somehow we felt uh, differently. I bought a, a bunch of tickets, plane tickets. So every second week I went out to see her. He ca started coming to Toronto more like every couple of weeks. If we were talking, he said, uh, oh, I'm wasting my time. Oh, I don't wait my time. We don't have to get married right away. Next year, we're going to get married. If you agree with me, it's OK. If not, we got together and got married. Next month is going to be 25 years. We just live from day to day. <laughs> it's not very exciting. We get up in the morning. He helps with the breakfast. Max is a type of a man. If you need anything, you could count on Max. People go out of his way to do 
favors for people. Nice bake. You serious? That's a character of a person. He cares for people and for people's lives. For nothing. Just as a favor. He is romantic. He is not affectionate in front like some people are, you know. But he's very warm. That is fresh salmon. I hope that you're gonna like it. If you don't like it, then you're not gonna eat it. It's gonna be more for me. Got a side book to walk. She walks over there. He doesn't like too many people. He is very down to earth. And I think he loves me. I definitely love him. A movie camera? Movie camera, yeah. How, uh, how many feet you uh, can you take? It's our anniversary. Definitely he is my soulmate. He is my best, best friend. There is no words to describe the bond between us. My grandfather's story has taught me that true love does exist and that fate is real. If two people are meant to be, then regardless of anything, somehow, some way, their spirits will connect. These two have shown me the true meaning of love and how beautiful it can be. There's a famous quote that I think sums up what Max and Rena have found in each other and what I hope we all will find in someone along the way. A soulmate is someone we feel profoundly connected, as though the communicating and communing that takes place between us were not the product of intentional efforts, but rather a divine grace. Careful, careful. These are my grandparents, Max and Rena Fronenberg. I hope you enjoyed their story as much as I have. I'll be home again before you know it. All this careful thought has left you stoic. I'll be leaving I believe it's snowing on the east coast I'll be going But I heard that it's snowing out in Malibu Babe, can you believe it's snowing out in Malibu When I'm thinking of you my love I feel like anything is possible when you're back in my arms again I know that we will be unstoppable Must be hard to be with me sometimes Always trying to see behind my eyes I'll be leaving I believe the sun is on the rise should get rolling if I'm gonna catch my flight this afternoon. You know, I really should be on that flight this afternoon. When I'm thinking of you, my love, I feel like anything is possible. When you're back in my arms again 
I know that we will be unstoppable One look, one night One lonely touch The dark, the light I miss you too much What's wrong, what's right It's never enough Familiar to me Like I've seen you in my dreams You take me apart And sew me back up at the seams When once we were open wounds Now I'm camouflaged when I'm with you No beating heart Not even love could revive me 